1916, the bibliographer Henrietta Bartlett finished compiling with Alfred Pollard, the first edition of her Census of Shakespeare's Plays in Cordo, 1594 to 1709, published by the Elizabethan Club of Yale and Yale University Press. This book was the first attempt to systematically catalog and locate all extant copies of Shakespeare Cordos, and Bartlett and Pollard received letters of thanks from prominent figures in the field. Um, and it's still a widely used reference work today and is available in an online and updated version, the Digital Shakespeare Census, edited by Adam Hooks and Zachary Lesser. But the census was not received so rapturously in all quarters. That same year, the University Press received a letter from the Minneapolis book collector, Herschel V. Jones, alleging that the census had overlooked his seven Shakespeare quartos. He complained that, you evidently went on the assumption that only certain libraries have these books or could afford to have them, and that I like to have book statement accurate when they claim to be accurate. As a result of a clerical error, Bartlett's response letter was sent not as she intended to Yale UP, but directly back to Jones. In this letter, she was frank to the point of being impolitic, calling Jones, quote, a very disagreeable person, desirous of publicity. In response, Jones wrote an indignant letter to the Yale University librarian, Andrew Keogh. Ms. Bartlett's letter disturbed me. She said I must be a very disagreeable person, desirous of publicity. The fact is that I am so extremely modest that I have been able to collect seven quartos without local booksellers knowing about it. I work quietly. As I have international reputation with the book trade and I'm constantly receiving books from abroad, it would be quite unnecessary for me to advertise anywhere. After this somewhat Uriah Heep-like defense of his humility, Jones suggested that he might still be willing to provide information about the Shakespeare quartos, but that he would not work with Henrietta Bartlett. He told Keogh that I shall be pleased to cooperate with you, knowing that you have the proper attitude in mind towards my little collection. Bartlett remained nonetheless unimpressed by Jones's claims on behalf of his collection of Shakespeare quartos. She wrote to Keogh expressing her conclusion that of Jones's books, only three had a real claim to be included in the census. I should be glad of full descriptions of his Hamlet 1703, Henry V 1619, and Romeo 1637. Old Castle and Two Noble Kinsmen are not included in the census, and the other four are merely notes of reselling of copies already described. His contention that we had omitted his valuable library and that therefore the census was incorrect limits itself to the exclusion of three late quartos. Don't you think that is a good deal of a wolf cry? Of course, he would not have been so angry if he had not had the wrong letter, but that was not my fault. I am always sorry to antagonize collectors, but he's the only one except Mr. Folger who has not treated me nicely. As an epilogue to the story, Bartlett was as good as her word. In the revised 1939 edition of the census, she did indeed include those three copies. Their disagreement was thus not really about constituting the Shakespearean corpus. Ultimately, they agreed on the most important bibliographic points. Rather, it reflected a struggle over privilege and authority in which Jones expressed the perhaps justified sense that the project was over-prioritizing Ivy League institutions and overlooking Midwestern collections, and Bartlett was subjected, subjected to dismissive comments behind her back. The mistake with her letter laid bare tensions of status and entitlement, which they might otherwise have politely ignored. In other words, what is at stake in the Jones-Bartlett exchange is the question of who gets to decide which books are included in the census and who counts as a Shakespearean bibliographer. At nearly every stage of making the Shakespeare census, there were tensions around academic status, professionalization, inclusion and access, and between commercial and scholarly agendas. This was perhaps because the project was inescapably collaborative, Bartlett and Pollard relied heavily upon the participation of American collectors in particular to submit information about copies that Bartlett could not examine in person. She created a template that collectors could use to respond to queries about quartos in their possession with space to fill in information about binding, provenance, and condition, and later estimated the project had sent out over 400 letters in the lead up to the publication of the 1916 census. Bartlett was the architect of an early and ambitious bibliographic database, in this sense comparable to modern digital humanities projects in that it required careful editorial discernment and coordination of many participants. <laughs>
Bartlett's gender inevitably framed this performance of scholarly sociability. In a recent article, Kate Osmond offers a theoretical paradigm for feminist bibliography, which she defines as, quote, the use of bibliographic methodologies to revise how book history and related fields categorize and analyze women's text and labor. For Osmond and for Valerie Wayne in a recent edited collection, a feminist bibliography promotes writing by women, but also the study of women's labor in book production and in traditionally feminized fields such as librarianship and cataloging. Adam Hooks has also placed Bartlett within the tradition of feminist bibliography, pointing out that she promoted women's participation in the field through her teaching and public exhibits. I would argue that viewing Bartlett's work through this lens also illuminates important problems of gendered authority and expertise in the Shakespeare census. Certainly the problem of Bartlett's gender is implicitly articulated in the background of many of these exchanges, as in Jones's stated preference for working with Keogh, whom he describes as having the proper attitude, or when a friend of Jones wrote to Keogh assuming that Bartlett was a secretary in the Yale UP office rather than the editor of the census. Bartlett was the point of contact with the majority of American contributors. In this sense, questions about gender and scholarly authority must be central to the history of the Shakespeare census, because Bartlett was in many ways the public face of the project. Bartlett also had very different ideas about the value and purpose of early Shakespeare quartos than some of her collaborators. As the exchange with Jones suggests, her work on the Shakespeare census might be described as a kind of anti connoisseurship for her, the value of a book inhered not in its rarity, expense, or appearance, but in its ability to constitute a corpus, to be part of a larger whole. The collector whose relationship with Bartlett arguably most registers these tensions is Henry Folger, whom she complained in that early, earlier letter had not treated her nicely. Bartlett made a habit of writing to Folger after auctions in the 1910s and 1920s, including the Britwell, Clausen, and White sales, to ask which books he had bought. Folger was not exactly obstructive, in fact, he was unfailingly polite, but nor did he seem particularly eager to share information. He often responded with some variation of the claim that his books were in storage or otherwise inaccessible to him. So you can see some examples here. I cannot tell anything about the imprint until I return to the city, being now in the country. This I will not do for three or four weeks. And here are some other examples. These and the other books are packed away in storage, and my memoranda about them is insufficient. To be fair, Folger's collection was vast, and his assertions that his books were in storage or awaiting description were probably true. And he usually did eventually provide Bartlett with lists of recent purchases. But Folger was highly sensitive to his ability to move the market. And the fact remained that his participation in the census project potentially undermined his prospects of buying at favorable rates. He himself admitted this to Bartlett when he wrote that, I never care to have my purchases advertised, believing I get along better in buying if I do not say much about what I have. For Bartlett, making such information public could only redound to the benefit of the greater scholarly and bibliophilic community. Whereas for Folger, still buying up large segments of the market for Shakespeare quartos, most publicity was bad publicity. The tension between Bartlett and Folger attests to her conviction that owning Shakespeare quartos entailed demanding public obligations. The census demystified the rarefied world of early 20th century Shakespeare collecting by locating and describing books in private hands. In this sense, it reflected Bartlett's vision of what American private collecting could be at its best intellectually ambitious, comprehensive, and accessible. In a 1935 address to the Grolier Club, she praised her old friend, the Grolier librarian, Ruth S. Granis, for helping to open the club's exhibitions to the public and, quote, introducing a much broader and really more useful attitude toward the world without your gates. As Bartlett would have known well, the Grolier was the first institution in the United States to regularly stage exhibitions of rare books. This was a period of American collecting in which Bartlett would have seen no reason why private collectors should not be at the forefront of public facing educational and curatorial work if they adopted what she called a more useful attitude. Bartlett's slightly provocative or challenging tone in that speech is perhaps indicative of her double edged relationships to the bibliophilic organizations and social groups that were still formally closed to women. Her experience of exclusion from full participation in bibliophilic institutions like the Grolier Club or the Elizabethan Club 
may well have given her more of a sense of license to speak her mind by, for example, emphasizing access to books for students and the general public. Similarly, the fact that her teaching was occasional and contingent, consisting of invited lectures at Yale and elsewhere and in private courses at her home in New Haven, may have allowed her to teach subjects like bibliography and the history of printing long before they were formally institutionalized in English departments. In this sense, her career might be placed in context with other early 20th century women scholars and teachers who, as Rachel Sagner Burma and, and Laura Heffernan have recently described in The Teaching Archive, were often, quote, themselves unaccredited or playing catch up in these decades of professionalization, and for whom teaching research methods and literary histories to non-traditional students and female undergraduates was a critical practice. Bartlett herself seemed keenly aware of the uneven economies of bibliographic work, as when she wrote in 1916 that, I speak at University of Pennsylvania, a 12th on portfolios and quartos, and Professor Schelling is sadly asking if I have any academic degrees. Alas, I never heard of a degree, and I'm merely a humble person who happens to know something about Shakespeare. Bartlett, in fact, held a library degree from the Pratt Institute in New York, but her tongue-in-cheek description of herself as merely a humble person suggests an implicit critique of scholarly hierarchies. Despite this moment of satirical self-deprecation, Bartlett seems to have known the value of her work. Historians and literary scholars often associate the new bibliography with the professionalization of the field. But Bartlett had already spent her career attempting to professionalize her role. The structural disadvantages that she experienced as a woman without a doctoral degree may well have motivated her insistence that she be paid for her cataloging and bibliographic labor. She repeatedly refused to take on unpaid reference work. In 1923, in response to a query from the bookseller Gabriel Wells, she wrote that, you will readily understand that I cannot spend the time to do a piece of research work like this, no matter how interesting, unless I do it on order as I used to do for Mr. George G. Smith, and as I'm at present doing for Mr. White, Mr. Forzheimer, and other people. My time is well taken up out if you care to send me the book, I shall be glad to send you a signed opinion at the end of a week, and my fee will be from $15 to $25, according to the amount of time I spend on it. Although Bartlett was by the 1920s a respected bibliographer and cataloger, as, as suggested by this list of past employers, she had by this point worked for many major American collectors. Her refusal to take on unpaid work is a consistent theme throughout her career. Financial precarity seems to have sometimes been a concern. In 1914, Pollard wrote to her that, quote, I am really sorry that Mr. Huntington won't have a woman librarian, as you would have filled the position finely, and I am quite ashamed that you should be considering finances a little anxiously, as you have looked after my financial interests so generously. Indeed, when the idea for the Shakespeare census was first proposed by the Elizabethan Club in 1913, it was Bartlett who advocated for a salary for her in Pollard. I explained that I could not afford to give much time to it, as I was obliged to work for my bread and cheese at the same time. Bartlett dedicated much of her professional life to documenting the material instantiations of Shakespeare's plays, and her understanding of bibliographic labor was similarly attentive to the material conditions necessary for scholarly work, money, time, and physical access to books. As a founding member of the Haraswitha Club, a bibliophilic society for women, and as a teacher of bibliography, she clearly played a leading role in an alternative scholarly community that established its own teaching and mentorship networks for women bibliographers, collectors, and librarians. More broadly, the motivating ethos of her work centered on making early Shakespeare quartos easier to access for study and editing. Like the Shakespeare census, this was the project of a lifetime. But her understanding of the embodied experience of bibliography, the need for access to books and reading rooms, is documented in smaller acts of mentorship and advocacy, such as a reference written to the Grolier Club for one of her students in 1928. I understand that you do not wish women to study in your library afternoons and have been very careful myself to observe this rule. I have a pupil, Miss Elizabeth White of Waterbury, who comes to town for two days a week in order to do work which cannot easily be done except at the Grolier Club. She is very anxious to be allowed to work in your library on Tuesday afternoons during January until four o'clock. If you can see your way of permitting her to do this, it will be a favor to her and to me. The chairman of the Grow Your House Committee wrote back agreeing to make an exception for Elizabeth White, while stipulating that 
I believe this restriction to be proper and that the rule should continue in force. In moments like these, involving the often unrecognized and mundane work of writing reference letters and leveraging her scholarly and social networks, Bartlett lived out her commitment to ensuring a broader cohort of students could work with the original editions of Shakespeare's plays. It was an admittedly partial and contingent victory, but a victory nonetheless. And Bartlett had always been comfortable bending the rules of clubs that, in any case, would never have had her as a member. Thank you. <laughs>